What is up, Fleet fans, and welcome back to my channel. I am joined by the man, the myth, the legend himself, Ryan Snelling. Ryan, tell the people what you do and uh, why you're here. I am a part of Sight and Sound. It's a great podcast. It's a great YouTube channel. Yeah. And we talk about things like glass. <laughs> also, music and television. But, yeah. you know, we, we said it last night. You were in my video. And uh, we talked about how privileged we were to get such a notable film right out the gate in 2019 you're right, you're so, right. this is exciting this was one i was looking forward to i know you were as well it, it, it was in my most anticipated movies of the year list so i walked in with my head held high i'm like this thing is going to rock ryan and i know you were looking forward to it as well now yeah. you can find all of ryan's links in the description if you want to check him out today we are diving deep Spoiler alert, it's going to be spoiler heavy. I said this in my non-spoiler review. I, there's no way to talk about this film without just diving into it. So I want to start at kind of the beginning. We may jump a little bit, but we're going to start at the beginning and just hash out what in the world is going on with Glass and Ryan. Just some overall thoughts from you real quick. What did you think about the movie? Yeah, I kind of just was disappointed all around. Um, the, the first half of the movie, it was fine. It was acceptable, I guess. I just wasn't interested. So mm. it was just sort of a, a thing of preference uh, in the first half. Um, it was cool to see some of the characters come back. Um, but other than that, I just wasn't really vibing with it. Uh, in the second half of the film, I thought it was an utter disaster, as a matter of fact, uh, on a story level, but also... Uh, filmmaking wise uh yeah. the direction i thought was absolutely pitiful and if you guys see any of my reviews i don't always get to touch on things like that because it's usually competent but i i saw a lot of incompetence at the end of this film and uh it just sort of solidified that i just i don't know i guess i was never going to be happy with this movie <laughs> <laughs> well I, would, I wouldn't say that i listen I, I liked it more than you did because you I did. gave this a 60%, a 6 out of 10. Yeah. There were things that I really enjoyed. And after sitting and kind of thinking about it, and I know we talked about this earlier, I liked the things that I liked maybe a bit more. But I also disliked the things that I disliked maybe even more than that. It's just there are such high highs and then low lows with this film Talking about the good, we'll start with that. I, I really enjoyed how this movie started. You get thrown back into David Dunn's story, a character that I love from Unbreakable, and you get to see this relationship between he and his kid, the same actor that played his kid. I love seeing that, but it's kind of like an Oracle Batman situation. He's riding him through all of these things and telling him, Dad, you need to go here, here, and here. And he is this mystery superhero and has been for quite some time now that I'm thinking about it, it's been a long time. How has nobody gotten a good picture of him with social yeah. media? He's got to be, he's a very sneaky guy. But I really liked how he started out with that. And his mission here is to find the Horde, to find James McAvoy, who has a bunch of little girls locked up. What did you think about kind of getting thrown back into this particular storyline? Well, I told you it was smart. It was probably the, the most natural way that this movie could get started because David Dunn as a character were the furthest removed uh, it's been like 19 years since we've checked in with that guy. Yeah. So to start off with him right away uh, and, and to see his son again, we learned what happened to his wife and all of that stuff. It was super, yeah. super natural. That was uh, sad. Pun like intended. It was <laughs> um, and, and I don't mean to jump around though, but I, I don't think, and you can just stop me and move no, on. No, go I'm ahead. I'm getting too far go ahead. ahead. No, but no, no. That, to speak on how poorly I thought the ending sort of treated all of these characters, it's David Dunn and his treatment is part of the reason why I didn't buy the whole concept. Everything of, uh, what's what's her face? Ryan Murphy's girl who plays the doctor, the actress. Oh, I can't think of her gosh. name. Yeah, you know who yeah. I'm talking about. She was fine. Was I, I didn't buy her storyline because David Dunn has been roaming the streets for 19 years, protecting, serving as a vigilante. And I don't think someone, a, a hero of 19 years, can be convinced in one day that he that none of that happened or none of it was what he thought it was, what he perceived. Yeah. And that's that's one of the few reasons why I don't buy uh, a, a lot of this movie. I, I said it yesterday. A lot of it was easy and convenient. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I, I think there were risks. I think there were more risks than I anticipated 
that were taken, whether they paid off for me or, or not. I, I do appreciate a filmmaker that is going to make those kinds of risks, and we've seen it with yeah. his career before. You know, he's got the horrible films. I mean, films that are some of the worst of the decade with After Earth and The Last Airbender, not this decade, but The Last Decade. But then we have movies like The Sixth Sense and Unbreakable and even Signs has a lot of great stuff in it. So... A filmmaker that takes risks is great. And you were talking about Sarah Paulson, by the way. Sarah Paulson, yes. Why I couldn't think of her name. She was treated, and not just her, multiple people throughout the movie. I didn't think she was that good in the movie. She I was fine. Her character yeah. was bland. I mean, she was okay, but the writing for some of these characters. And can we, I know this is skipping a little bit forward, but what about a M. Night's cameo? How'd you feel about that? <laughs> it was just kind of nothing. It, again, it was forced. It, it, yeah. was, it was the. Again, you're revisiting David Dunn, and I guess you're, you're trying to bring back the memories of when you watched Unbreakable. The last thing that you need to involve into that is the guy who was at the stadium the one time. <laughs> who got? Didn't he like walk into the bathroom and get drugs? Was it that guy? Uh, maybe. I can't remember. Maybe. But I it was. Remember. It just wasn't a thing in Unbreakable uh, other than an M. Night Shyamalan cameo. So just to do it again, it was forced. Yeah. It was just not clever or, yeah. I don't know. It, it was just kind of lame. I don't know <laughs> I don't know if it was the writing of the scene or just the fact that he had to have himself in the movie, but I thought, yeah, that was, everything you said is correct. Yeah. And I just thought he was bad. M. Night's not a good actor. And when he He's puts not. himself in his movies, it's become this reoccurring joke for me. I'm like, oh, there's M. Night. Now stop talking. He said uh, his line, something along the lines of, yeah, I used to be down a dark path, but I found redemption or something oh, like that. We're yes. like, great. Good for Guy you. I don't care about. That's that's great. <laughs> Not M. Night Shyamalan. Uh, yeah, so things like that, just throughout the movie, they kept being kind of forced in, in a way, and there were yeah. plot points that really I just I didn't like. But the central theme for me of what was going on with these characters and going to the asylum, not to shift... Oh, well, one thing before we get to the uh, the actual asylum. The scene where David Dunn goes to the two guys' house to kind of throw him against the wall and, and whatnot. When he... I have to talk about this. When he opens up the door, the guy goes, Is that a raccoon? But the door opens. Like, you hear the knob. Is that a raccoon? The door opens. The door slams. And then he says... Is that a raccoon? I'm like, dude, that's a raccoon? That's a freaking mutant raccoon. Yeah. Get out of there. And they just sit there. And they're they're emotionless and their reactions in the movie. I, I, I just noticed it throughout. It's just it didn't it didn't feel real to me. Do you have an opinion on this? I know it's stupid, uh, it was just goofy. It was, it was just goofy. goofy. And, yeah. And, and you know, some people might watch this video and think I'm going to spend the entire time complaining. And I, I want to make sure that I don't do that. I, it, it, there are definitely scenes that are written so poorly, so lame, fall flat. I didn't even think the movie was particularly funny. And I know that it wanted to be in parts. Um, but other scenes were, like, really, really well written, I thought. Yeah. So it was just kind of like this 50-50 balance. And if you were to ask me what my overall rating was, I don't really do that on my videos, but I do. I, I would say it's a 5 out of 10, so it's just kind of below what you would rate it. Understandable. But, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it was just one of those goofy things. Um, and, and we talked about this before uh, we hit record. What's interesting about that is that's sort of like the end of picking up where we left off with David Dunn, and then shortly after that's when he... Uh, finds the beast uh, or the cheerleaders in mm. the uh, in the abandoned warehouse. But it's funny how it it's kind of secretly to, to the untrained eye. It's not a continuation of a character that existed in another movie. And mm. we talked about this a second ago. Yes, the yes. idea that I am convinced that there are the majority of people that go see this movie this weekend. Um, are going to see it because they saw Split two years ago. Yes. Not because they know that it's an unbreakable sequel. That's I think if you were point. born after 1995, unless your parents were freaks and they have a movie theater room in their basement and they trained you <laughs> on every single thing there is to know on film, I don't think you know, or maybe they don't know, that Unbreakable is even a thing. Yeah. Um, and it, when Bruce Willis shows up at the end of Split, it could 
you know, just sort of parallel seeing Nick Fury at the end of Iron Man. It just means something else is coming, which yeah. would be glass. Mm-hmm. Uh, it doesn't necessarily tell the audience that something could have happened before. You have to go watch this old movie. Yeah. yeah. So it, it still kind of works. It introduces you to David Dunn and it tells does. you. And it, it, and it works for the untrained eye. And I don't even fault anyone for knowing that. I just think it's interesting to consider, and it keeps the fanboys in check. Uh, it does. No, I completely agree. That's a great point. And like we said, you know, maybe somebody who doesn't, not have the knowledge because even the people who have the knowledge just haven't seen the movie they don't have connection to Mr. Glass and David Dunn so when we see what happens to these characters at the end maybe it didn't impact those people as much and maybe those are the people that are going to like this movie more than me and you because that decision well more than me (laughs) but that decision to kill off those characters was one that does not sit well with me and it's not that they decided to kill them off it's how they went about it. And we'll get into that in just a sec. I, I want to talk about real quick when he was holding the girls captive. I did like aspects of that. You get to kind of flesh out McAvoy even more than he's already been fleshed out. That Definitely. circular shot that kept coming around to McAvoy. I around the was, table? Around the table. Yeah. I thought was gorgeous. And seeing his portrayal of this character, I, like, I, got, I got chills just seeing how wonderful of a job he's doing. And a job that is going to go unnoticed by the end of the year because we saw this with Split. Not saying he needs to get nominated for awards and stuff like that, but at the end of the year, when Split had came out a long time prior to that, no major outlet or critic was talking about McAvoy's performance in Split, and I feel like it's going to be the same way. Regardless of what you think about the movie, his performance was mind-bogglingly good in this movie, and I think he's just as good in this as he was in his own film, Split, so I really like those scenes. The action in those scenes, you know, the film style, it was it was M. Night's film style. He's doing what he does. He's filming it the way he's going to fill it. What'd you, what'd you think about the action in the first half of the movie? Uh, it was okay. When he throws the table, it was a really lame, poor CGI shot. Yeah. I thought action was... Kind of a weakness throughout. It was. Um, it it was. never really felt like, and we also didn't want it to be a CGI fest. And I think Unbreakable and even Split captured the action and built tension uh, properly because you know those movies set out to be something different, and then at the end they reveal uh, their true hand, if you yeah. will. Yeah. But but now sort of the hand is exposed, and I just expected a, a better balance of realistic action and I just I didn't think the action was particularly shot very well I like I like the idea that it wasn't a CGI fest because I didn't want that to be the case either uh, I just expected a little bit something more clever mm-hmm. and so again it was just kind of a weakness throughout for me I agree with you on that and then so we get to the part where they fall out the window and then they're captured they go to the asylum now this for me It could come across as boring to some, and I get that. It was very slow. It's not where I think a lot of people thought this movie was going to go, but I saw it as more of a battle of the brain, a battle of the minds, if you will, as opposed to an actual battle. Because going in, I'm like, oh, are we going to get superhero and supervillain throughout the entire movie? But no, they're locked in this asylum, and Sarah Paulson's character is... Doing what she says she's doing, which is keeping them restrained and trying to convince them that they are not these comic book characters. Now, we get into the very on-the-nose comic book talk, and I know you have your thoughts about that. What did you think of that use, I guess, of, oh, you guys aren't comic book characters, the villain is this, the heroes are this, here comes the side characters throughout the movie, and it's mostly Mr. Glass that is doing this, but what, it, what were your thoughts on the use of comic books in Glass? Uh, in Glass, uh, it was less clever than it was in Unbreakable for me. Like, Unbreakable, similar to Chronicle, us comic book movie lovers <laughs> actually appreciate yeah. when, you know, Unbreakable is an origin story in disguise, but yeah. the, the tone is different, and it, it feels like a film, uh, for lack of a better term. It just feels like it's something different. It's a different beast, uh, another pun, nah. very intended. Um, but... But it gets to the point in Glass where you have characters looking straight at you into the camera and laying out, oh, so this character that I interact with is this trope, and we are following this comic book storyline. Now, they will use fictional storylines from comics. When they walk into the comic book shop, it's made up titles all over the shelves. But it's still, it, it brings up so many tropes and archetypes, and it's more than just... Ira Glass pointing out, you're the hero in Unbreakable. I'm the villain. And 
it's cool in Unbreakable because the logic is like, hey, I'm weak as shit. My bones are made of glass. Yeah. There has to be another. <laughs> you don't even need comic books to come up with that logic. That could just be a cool movie in and of itself. Yeah. Uh, and it just so happens to be a comic book origin as yeah. well. Yeah. But uh, it's just not clever when it, when a lot of the dialogue is telling the audience what they're seeing mm -hmm. as opposed to them coming to that conclusion of themselves because I think you just get more credit uh, for being an intelligent, clever movie if the audience comes up with that afterwards. I think that's the majority of the third act, what Mr. Glass was doing. And I like how he started out with him. He, he seems very feeble and, oh, I'm sad and I don't know what's happening. But really, he has this master plan. And I yeah. liked his master plan. His master yeah. plan to break out the horde and have this massive showdown in front of th this... Tallest buildings in the nation. That in was front kind of, of the cameras. That, that was kind of on the nose. <laughs> I was like, okay, we don't have to keep saying that. But I like what you're doing here. And I like that yeah. he came on the mic and he's like, you're going to break out of here and you're going to use your strength. And seeing David Dunn do that, really, not for the first time, but really seeing him bend this door and break it down, I'm like, all right, here we go. Yeah. Here's the buildup. And, and again, to give this movie credit, um, I think the big CGI fest, if this was a traditional superhero movie, I think the CGI fest, the, the movie would have gone to Osaka Tower, I believe, <laughs> and they would have battled it out in front of a city, and it would have right. ended like the Avengers. But yeah. no, um, it stayed within its uh, realm, and uh, I at least at this that. point. Yo, I, I do too. That. I liked it. Yes. Uh, it just happened to be the poor, the worst directed sequence of the entire film. The execution. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 The more I think about it, Everything going on in the psychiatric ward is lame, easy, mm. convenient. Okay. Um, because, again, they they had that meeting uh, where all four of them sat down, Sarah Paulson and then the three of them. She convinced them all that they were not who they thought they were. Very easily um, convinced. Very easily. Too. And then that was like it. it. It it wasn't a journey of, of, of that. It, yeah. it was one scene. Yeah. And then she planted a seed, and I guess the movie's trying to telegraph that she gets a little bit of credit for only having to have one conversation, but I don't buy it for a second. No. Uh, again, yeah, David Dunn was a hero for 19 years. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but the idea, I don't think those lights actually keep back the beast. All the beast has to do uh, is turn around and walk backwards to the door, or close his eyes. But close, even that, close. eyes open. Turn your back to the door and walk backwards. <laughs> yeah. And then that's it. Yeah. And then all hell breaks loose. A lot um, of things not very well explained in no, the movie at no, all. No, no, not no. that they had to be, but just very... I, I, I guess the only person that I truly thought was in a pickle was David Dunn because of the water. Yes. Um, yes. But it, I guess we probably have a point to make about water and David Dunn here in, oh, in a minute. Gosh. But uh, but yeah. Two points, actually. Uh, the point that, the, that you made in the car after the movie when... Skipping ahead just a little bit, when he's fighting with the horde in the the water, what would you call that? The big container of water. Why does it start to crack? Yeah, uh, is it the huge amount of pressure? But wouldn't the water just go out the top? Yeah, it... it's it's. I don't even think two humans is enough to cause that thing to rupture anyway. Yeah, uh, it, it just. <laughs> when I was watching it, it just didn't feel like it followed any logic. No, the the, the amount of logic in the third act in general, just that and what happens with the SWAT team because. It was covered by a tarp. So the water, you're right, the water would have just spilled over the top. It's yeah. just a tarp covering that thing. It's there's it's not a container. If it's a container and it's a sealed container, then yes, the pressure will start, but the water would have just spilled also, out. Why does it break? No institution has a tank of water outside <laughs> covered by a tarp. The tarp was there because the characters needed to fall into it in Act Three. Yeah. But other than that, makes no sense. Yeah, that was that was stupid. Easy, and lame, convenient. It, I yeah, I completely agree. And the the SWAT team when they're coming up and they're using their riot shields and they're not even it doesn't even dude, look like they're showing effort. They're just going, dude, like all this. of it. Shoot him! All of it. The, Get a gun! Shoot him! The geography, because you know, I, I think a lot of these sequences are born from the directors and the writers, like maybe playing with action figures on a table, and maybe they should be done that way. I this is where like. this character is, this is where this character is. It probably helps a whole hell of a lot to write a scene. I'm sure the Russo brothers did that for Infinity War. I do it all the time. Um, but this was just kind of the worst version of that because based on the way that the scene is edited, yeah. um, it doesn't make sense that Ira is just wheeling around in a wheelchair <laughs> when <laughs> when all this shit's going on. Um, it, it doesn't make any sense that the Beast is fighting David Dunn and is 
completely normal human son is standing in between them just having a monologue. Yeah. With, uh, um, poorly constructed monologue. It, too, the yeah, Beast and David so. Dunn. Like, that's the battle. Beast versus David Dunn. There is, like, maybe a one to two minute departure just watching David Dunn bend steel. So, it yeah. begs the question, what's happening behind you? Yeah, because yeah, you're yeah. supposed to be at war. Uh, it's just the way that it's edited, directed, choreographed, it was so poor. It was. It was so poor, and I didn't buy it. It was. I, I agree, and it's like glass falls out of his chair after what the beast does to him, and it's like nobody runs to pick him up for like five minutes. He's yeah. just laying there. I'm like, your mother's there. Why doesn't... And she does eventually, but where's she at here? Right. And then where are characters at when certain characters are doing things like... I don't understand. And then the relationship between uh, Anya Taylor-Joy's character and his son and the mother at the end... I know I'm skipping to the end. Again, we're skipping again. But when they're sitting there holding hands... They didn't know Anya Taylor Joy's character. They, yeah. they 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 didn't even get a chance. Did they even get a chance to meet? In Not the really. Film? I don't remember. And then it's the mother of the psychopath who killed a ton of people. The guy who yeah. tried to kill your dad, tried to kill your father, and you're sitting there holding his mother's hand. Yeah, I just don't. What? I don't buy that. I. I no. Mr. Glass's mom is such a weird character because she's like such a normal yes. person. Uh, and is so accepting of who her son was up until the point, up until the moment he died. She's a psychopath. And, it, and then it was Kumbaya at the train station. It's yeah. just, it's just so weird. Yeah. And then they, the, when we figure out, I'll get into the twists in just a second. But when the actual footage of them is uploaded to everyone to see, how long did it take for that footage to go viral? Because listen. I've tried to make multiple videos go viral in my lifetime. <laughs> it's a very difficult challenge. It doesn't happen in one day. Well, sometimes it does. I, I think not a stroke of luck, though. And wouldn't people just say, well, that's fake? I think I I think I think kind of buy the viral of oh, it, I think. I but I don't think he set a premiere up on YouTube. and was <laughs> like, it, it had to have been... Uh, a relatively short period of time. It's not like a week went by and all those characters got to know each other before the train station. That had to have been right after, which is funny because uh, that makes it even more stupid because, yeah, David Dunn's son is just sitting there. His father had just passed away, just passed away. from drowning in a puddle. Yeah. <laughs> as, if, as if he's willing to accept that reality that quick. Um, and, and again, it's Kumbaya at the train station. Yeah. It's just, it's, again, Preference-wise, I just wasn't into a lot of it. I thought some of the, it wasn't funny. Some of the writing was bad. I think the third, maybe even the second half of the movie, I think that's what's genuinely bad about Glass. Everything else, I can just knock it. Uh, I can just knock it up to. It, it didn't live up to the hype. Okay. I, I don't prefer the story, that kind of thing. I wasn't into it. But it's the second half of the movie, maybe the last third of the movie, that I think is actually bad. I think that's my disappointment levels because I I did and I genuinely enjoyed the first half so much and what they were building up to. And not that I wanted this massive showdown. I knew M. Night wasn't going to give yeah. us that because he's M. Night Shyamalan. He's not going to do what you expect him to do. But to throw in, and now let's get into the final major thing we need to talk about. the All the twists, right? Not yeah. just one twist, all the twists. Let's start with the fact that... Uh, Kevin Wendell Crumb's father was on the train that David Dunn was on. Why was um, this? What purpose did it serve? Other for a really good line of dialogue from Mr. Glass. Other than that, which I, I enjoyed that line of dialogue. Other than that, it served no purpose. Why was it in this movie? I think the, Why? the entire time I was watching this movie, from the get-go, I was thinking to myself in the theater... Isn't it interesting how all three of these superhumans uh, live in the exact same area? Um, and, and maybe Mr. Glass is from somewhere else and then they ended up just together. But mm -hmm. I, I was thinking about that as I watched the movie. So I guess that twist actually helps explain it a little bit. And I think it's I think it's a cool idea. It doesn't really bother me that much. Yeah. Um, and I think it would have landed even more if it was sort of like the only thing, right? But I, I think our yeah. conversation, our conversation would just be about how it's like the most underwhelming Shyamalan twist ever because yes. it's like just a twist any other movie can make. Mm -hmm. um, we could have that conversation, but there's there's so many other twists that I kind of had forgotten yeah, well, that about that, that specific one. Yeah. yeah. So then the next twist is. We start to see the tattoos getting revealed, and I'm like, okay, first of all, where is that? Was that in the movie? At, at, yeah. No, no, what? No, was it? Was that build up at all in the movie? Did I miss that? No. Okay. Um, I think the movie would have been a lot 
more interesting and more engaging if we knew that information the entire time. Yes, I completely agree because that would have foreshadowed the events one, which I didn't need the, uh, the events foreshadowed, but I needed more information. Who are these people? Why are they here? What's the point? Unless you're setting up for another film, I don't care about this. So then our heroes get killed. Finally, yeah. somebody pulls a gun out and shoots him. If you were going to do that, you should have done it at the beginning because I'm like, okay, maybe she doesn't want him to die because she wants him to battle it out. But then it's like, but you caught them in the first place because you knew they were superhuman. So what was the point of having them battle it out and not shooting them? They should have shot them. So the, so Kevin Wendell Crumb gets shot. I loved his, didn't like the fact that he died, but I loved his actual death scene. I yeah. thought it was great acting. Uh, how would you feel about his, first we'll start with him, his death. Wait, who's dead? Uh, Kev, uh, uh, Kevin Wendell Crumb, uh, the Hordes. How'd you feel about the Hordes' death? Oh, um, I liked it. It was kind of, it was very odd that he just ran, he qu uh, cut to uh, the kid real quick because that was kind of, it, it felt like it was a super dramatic moment and yes. then it wanted me to laugh for a second. I yes. don't know. But maybe that just comes with the territory. McAvoy's insane uh, with this character. So yeah. maybe that's a lame nitpick and I'm not even going <laughs> to use that as criticism. Uh, I thought it was really well done. Like I said, I think McAvoy was the, uh, my favorite thing and the best thing of the movie. Yes, and. Was. Uh, I thought it was it was 100% the best death. Like yes. I thought the glass death was lame because of his mom. It was distracting and David. Um, yeah, it's terrible. I, I liked glass. Oh, but let, let's get into David's death. Yeah. Have we accepted the fact now? Regardless of what you think about the ending, this has to be upsetting for everyone who is a fan of this character. He died by drowning in a tiny puddle. Yeah. Via a man that he should have been a lot stronger than. Now I know. He was in water, right? And I guess that takes away his strength. He, his body was on the ground. It was his head in a small puddle. Reach around. Pull his... What? So, what's interesting about this is David Dunn, I don't think, is like anybody, any film fan's favorite movie character ever. Because he kind of lacks personality. I think, I think you watch Unbreakable because of the, the collective whole. Uh, not because David Dunn is a yeah. So yeah. so I think his death would have been served. It logically makes sense the water thing. His death would have been served better Big if puddle. if the buildup was better. Again, I just agree. like the Sarah Paulson stuff. If yeah. if a little bit more was inserted, uh, if the final fight wasn't reduced to GoPro uh, medium shots of actors' faces and they're just grappling like they're in yeah. WCW versus NWO Revenge. Like yeah. if it wasn't reduced to that. Uh, it could have been. It could have been a beautiful moment. Um, I didn't even think it really sat well with him and his son, which would have provided the most pathos. Um, but it was just kind of uh, he shoved a cop. Yeah. And, uh, didn't even get any dialogue from him. It, without yeah. the dialogue. So it just. I just don't think it was. It wasn't executed well. It was poorly directed. I, and I, I, I told you right before we hit record. I forgot that the movie killed off the main character <laughs> because there were so many other things and I didn't feel the weight of it. Yeah. We were sitting on the couch and I was just like, wait a minute, that movie did kill David Dunn. David Dunn's dead. <laughs> He's dead. He's dead. <laughs> Mr. Glass is dead. They're all dead. <laughs> what? Oh, and I'm, I'm the same way I because their deaths were so not impactful. I mean, I guess uh, McAvoy's was, but they were just, they didn't... Hit with me, and I think it's what you said. This is the buildup. Yeah. We didn't get the proper buildup. Listen, we said this before. Okay, maybe the twist is because we were trying to anticipate what the twist was going to be. Maybe they killed off one of the main characters. We would. We both agreed that would have been fine. Yeah. If you do it and you have the right buildup and you have the emotional payoff, that's fine. I'm not upset that they killed off all three of the characters. Yeah, it kind of sucks, but I, I get it. And I get, and I said this in my review, and I kind of understand what M. Night was trying to do. He was trying to twist on the twist of the superhero genre, bring in this society of people, and they're not the only heroes. This society goes in and takes out superpowered people. Listen, I like the idea. I think it would make a cool television show. This society that goes in and kills metahumans, right? I, I think that's a cool concept. But the execution and the way that they went about it with these characters that we love, us that love Unbreakable, and most people who saw Split and they're like, oh, we're getting a sequel to Split. And then for those that saw both movies, oh, we're getting a finale of the trilogy. To kill off those characters in that manner, in that way, with that directing and writing and just the way that they went about it, that's to me why the movie was so disappointing. 
because I love so many elements and then you do that to the characters that we love and give us a really dumb ending where characters who hadn't even, it didn't seem like anyway, I may have missed the passage of time, but it didn't seem like they knew each other. They're well, it doesn't, make, it doesn't make sense to have a passage of time because they're all together at the train station and like I said, I don't think he waited a week to release the video. The whole point, <laughs> the whole point was that he exposed it to the world uh, very quickly. Yes. Um, I and then I guess I, that was another twist. Maybe. Wasn't that another twist? That he had went in and, and, and typed faster than any human could type? Because did you see that where he was kick, yeah. hitting the keys and it was going... Yeah. I'm like, it, no human can type that fast. But that was another twist as he released... He did it all on purpose, I guess. It was a suicide mission, as they yeah. said. I completely... Yeah. I I, about that. When you and I, or any film fan rather, when we sit down and make predictions for these movies, we, we consider the significance of the story. So yeah, we're fine with uh, a character dying if it means that it's part of a great story, a greater whole. Uh, and, and when people make predictions, we don't consider that the execution or the film could just be bad. You know yeah, what I mean? I agree with that. Like, we can make all the predictions in the world for Endgame, but, <laughs> and, and it completely clouds our fanboy judgment Better be good. And, and nobody asks the question mm -hmm. what if Endgame's like actually a bad movie yeah. no one has that conversation yeah. we just predict what's going to happen and assume that it's going to be the best thing ever and at the end of the day I, I'll say this I'm glad this was not an Avengers movie I'm glad it didn't have a giant <laughs> no, seriously I'm glad it didn't have a, a giant CGI battle at the end I am too he he did what he was going to do he, he took the chances that maybe I didn't anticipate him making but looking back on it it makes sense that M. Night did this, and it makes sense that he made these decisions. I just don't know why the execution was handled so poorly. It felt like it felt like a different director in yeah. the third act of the movie, and, and that, for me, is why this movie... Still, I know this was a lot of us ranting. I semi-enjoyed the movie. I, I liked certain things about it, and I think it had a lot of potential, and maybe... I'll watch it five more times and be like, yeah, I did that. I don't see my opinion changing on the ending. The ending yeah. for me was just so poorly handled and so many elements went into it. But I've talked enough. Ryan, thank you. Any more thoughts before we end this, by the way? I yeah, just... you made a massive mistake inviting me. What is this, your <laughs> longest video? Longest ever? video I've ever. We're at 30, 30 plus minutes right now. Never done a video this long. But I, I think this was a really good discussion. Do you have anything else you want to say about this movie before we wrap up? <laughs> oh no, come on, man. I, I semi enjoyed it. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Ryan, dude, awesome having you on here. Tell the Thank people you so much. where they can find you. The links are going to be in the description, so check that out. But where can they find you online? Uh, find me Twitter, Instagram, at WhatUpSnell, Sight and Sound podcast feed, Sight and Sound YouTube channel, right. Sight and Sound Patreon. Mm hmm. That's it. You should do it. And I, every now and then I'll guest host and we'll do some after parties and stuff like that. And you're, is, you're doing True Detective for I'm this, right? True Detective this Sunday. And I will definitely plug that on this channel multiple times because hopefully I can do it throughout. So far, first two episodes, so good. Yeah, uh, thank are. you guys so much for watching this video. Be sure this is your, your place, your forum. Talk about glass. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you disagree with some of the points that we brought up? Listen, it's fine. This is our place to talk about this movie, and I truly appreciate all of you who do that in the comments. Like this video if you want. You want more spoiler discussions because I I had a great time doing this. Just being able to hash out all of my thoughts, let you guys finally know why the ending of this movie bothered me so much. You guys are the absolute best. Yeah. <laughs> Be, oh, be cool. Be cool. And and I'll remind you, I'm cool. If you love Glass, that's awesome. I wish I was you. Like, obviously, I wish I could have a glowing review for Glass. I wish I wish I loved the film. So if you love the film, I'm jealous of you. I'm not mad at you. So I, I wish I was you. Oh, thanks so much. <laughs>